Welcome to Liberty.me Studio. Be part of the global liberty community at Liberty.me. Liberty lives here. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Tatiana Show. Today, my guest is Pamela Morgan, my absolute favorite attorney. Yeah, I said it in the Bitcoin space. Uh, Pamela, thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Tatiana, and that is a huge compliment, so I, I don't take it lightly. Thank you so much, and uh, I'm going to try to keep that place. There's a lot of, I know, good lawyers out there. Um, you don't believe me, but, but there are, uh, and I can put you in touch with some of them, but I'm, I don't want to because, you know, I like being your favorite lawyer. Perfect. Well, there are, no, there's a lot of really great lawyers in this space, but you have an uncanny knack of explaining things in a way that's super digestible and engaging. But before we get into all of that, I'm really excited about the show, um, and I want to jump the gun. Why don't you tell people a little bit about your background and, um, and you know, how you fit in? Sure. Uh, well, I'm an attorney, I'm an educator, and I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, I've been practicing in the Bitcoin cryptocurrency space for about a year and a half-ish. Uh, prior to that, I was in entrepreneurship education, and I decided to make the move to Bitcoin because I saw the potential to really change systems, specifically the legal system, and make it more accessible to everyday people. So and when I was in law school, I recognized the divide, as most people do, um, in the ability of the majority of people to actually access the legal system and access it in a way that isn't uh, completely overwhelming to them and doesn't take over their entire life. So. Uh, allowing people to use the law when they can um, and avoid uh, courts when, when they can as well. So I saw the potential for Bit Bitcoin and I got really excited about it and so I, I started researching and uh, really focusing my legal practice on uh, helping Bitcoin uh, startups in the space and that kind of evolved into really um, learning a lot about multisig and um, corporate governance and, and the technology in that. And so that led to uh, the launch of Third Key Solutions, which was launched at the end of March of this year. And Third Key Solutions is a company that focuses on um, key generation um, and secure storage, multi-sig, cold storage. And uh, basically we help people, um, wallets, exchanges, and Bitcoin startups implement multi-sig. Okay. Um, so how do you get other attorneys to pay attention to Bitcoin? Like, how do you explain it to them? Obviously, there's a really big learning curve. Um, I was actually thinking of asking you to explain Bitcoin to a regular person, but I thought that you might have a slightly different approach in the, in the legal world. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, it really depends on whether the lawyers heard of Bitcoin or not, and, and usually people have at least heard of Bitcoin at this point. Uh, many of them, and it also depends on how technologically savvy the lawyer is that I'm talking to. So if they're already predisposed to using current technology, um, then I can kind of kind of streamline the discussion. If not, it, it takes a little bit uh, of a longer um, a longer talk. But the the key, the selling point, is always my personal experience with Bitcoin. When I first, when I had my first client in Bitcoin, and I sent them my invoice. And I was paid in three minutes. And yeah, that's minutes. Um, if there are any lawyers watching, it's only true of three minutes. Uh, because in, in lawyer land, um, we're lucky if we get paid in 30 days, uh, three, you know, three weeks if we're very lucky. Usually it's more like three months. Sometimes it's three years. It involves a lot of negotiation. It involves a lot of haggling. It involves a lot of billing. You know, so to be paid in three minutes for my work, was absolutely amazing. I was like, this is the greatest thing ever. And uh, yeah, so now I try to only accept Bitcoin if I can for legal services. And, and that's usually a, a way that I can explain why Bitcoin is great. And then that leads me into having a discussion with them about, um, you know, about the way that, that digital currencies are changing the legal landscape. What are some ways that Bitcoin is changing the legal landscape and what does the timeline look like on that? Well, uh, you know, again, it really depends on, on lawyers and, and their practice areas right now. I know a lot of people that are working in this space, um, helping startups in this space, and so 
when we talk about Bitcoin, you know, in my world, Bitcoin touches basically every legal practice. So everything from estate planning, you know, if you have Bitcoin, have you dealt with it in your will? What will happen? You know, what will happen if something happens to you? Will your family be able to access it? To family law, uh, to you know, um, business. Everything is really going to be is already or will be touched by by Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. So um, I have that discussion with, with a lot of attorneys. And you know, the other really interesting project, I don't know if you're familiar with it or not, but there's this really cool project called Common Accord. It's commonaccord.org. And they want to decentralize law, which I, I'm sold already, right? And I have you heard of them? No, what does that mean? And uh, yeah, because I mean I don't know anything about that kind of thing. Yeah. So, yeah well, I mean, Absolutely. So we'll have to look at it. And, and I'm not affiliated with Common Accord at all other than just being a fan and trying to contribute when I can and trying to get the word out. Um, but, you know, when I was first approached, uh, I was approached by them with this idea that, hey, you know, have you seen this decentralized law project? It might be something you're interested in. And when I started looking at it, and if you can pull up the website whenever, again, it's commonaccord.org, um, their goal is law for the 21st century. And, and, it, and it's a combination of open source law with code. So why that's so cool is we hear a lot about smart contracts, right? And so how do you actually, what exactly is a smart contract? And that's a huge discussion. We can talk for hours about that. But at its core, a lot of people are moving towards the idea of having a smart contract be the, the things that can be executed automatically plus legal language in the background so that if something does end up having to go to court, you can actually have a judge adjudicate the rights. So that's what Common Accord does. Common Accord takes um, legal documents, like I can send them a document or you could send them a document for uh, a performance. And they would take each section of it and put it into code that then could, there, then could actually be put into a smart contract and pulled up and automatically executing payment provisions, et cetera. I'm not really sure that I understand how that would work. So I have a few different questions. Um, sure. The first question is, is okay, if, if there's all these people and they're, I, I mean, are they making up laws or are they just storing your contract online for reference later? And good. if, yeah, good go ahead. Question. Okay, good question. So we've seen this discussion, and I, I don't want to get too into it, but we've seen this discussion with, Roger Ver and, and OKCoin okay and this idea, I don't know if you've been following it at all, but there's this whole thing on Reddit about whether or not um, this, this contract was forged and there are two different versions of it and one has a termination clause and the other doesn't and one has, you know, both of them supposedly have the signature, but that's not really true. Anyway, so right now what we can do to prove a definitive contract in the regular world today is use something called proof of existence. And so if you and I have a contract, once it's signed, we can put that contract, essentially put a hash of that contract on the blockchain. Why, that's, why that matters is because later on we can say, okay, is this the real contract? And you can say, yes, it is. And you can prove it because you can match the hash of the document to the hash that's on the blockchain. So you can definitively prove the very last version of the so that's a powerful tool, and it costs like, I mean, in today's Bitcoin price, I don't know, 50 cents, 75 cents, something like that. Really, really easy to do. So you can do that now. How Common Accord is different is Common Accord basically has a, um, and, and please don't hold me to this, I'm going to do my best, but again, I, I'm not affiliated with them, so I'm going to try it. This is kind of third party here. But basically, what it allows you to do is I, as an attorney, or you as a performer, can give them your contract. And they will take clause by clause and, and code it so that your smart contract later will pull each clause in back to that definitive document. Now, hopefully, you'll never actually need the document, right? Because the smart contract will fully execute. But we can anticipate, like, there will be situations where a contract will not fully execute on its own. And those would be called exceptions, right? So let, let's, let's do a real, world, a real world example. Let's say that you um, are hired to sing at an event, okay? How can we make that, how can we turn that into a smart contract? Well, one thing we could do is send the document over to Common Accord and they could put it into the code. 
then what would happen is we could tie in these clauses from the code to Bitcoin payments. And we could secure those payments. They would basically be put up, almost like an escrow. And they would be put up. And if everything went well, the code would then execute after your performance. So it would say after a certain date, after Tatiana performs, the, mo the money is automatically released to her. Does that make sense? So if, but yeah. if something happened in the interim, like let's say that you, know, you, you were unable to perform or they canceled for whatever reason, then you'd have something called an exception. So what that means is that you would end up having this, this maybe a third party that comes in, maybe, and, and this is all depending on the smart contract and how it's written and how it's executed. But, but the, the exceptions are the interesting part, and the exceptions are usually where people end up in court. So what we're going to try to do is avoid that by including as much as we can in the front end. How does the contract, I mean, a contract is, a piece of paper, how does it know to release funds or not? Yeah, so that's part of tying in the payment mechanism. So in a, in a regular, you know, standard contract today, we have a bunch of promises, typically, right? You promise to perform, I promise to pay you for a performance. So it's a bunch of promises. Where the difference comes in with smart contracts and with Bitcoin and the powerful, the, 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 I think one of the most powerful aspects of it, is that in really high value contracts, like for example, when you're selling a home, you have a, a third party involved and you have an escrow agent, right? And so I say to you, you know, Tatiana, I'd like to buy your, your house. And you say, okay, well, give me a deposit down. And there are all of these things that both of us must do in order to basically have you give me the deed and you, get, and you give me the deed and I give you the money, right? So there are a number of things that can be automated in that process, right? Like after a certain amount of time passes, you either give me a firm offer or you get your money back or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So those types of things that will automatically happen for the passage of time or things that we can prove definitively happen maybe by a third party, um, those things can be automatically executed. But we can't make you do a walkthrough of the house. Right? Like, we can't physically make you perform. We can't physically make you, you know, sing. You could always say, no, I refuse to sing. Right? And so those things you can't actually automate. So those parts of contracts can't really ever be covered by, um, quote, unquote, smart contracts. Fully, fully automated contracts. We wouldn't want them to be anyway. So Does that answer the question? Somewhat. So the advantage is that you don't have to have an escrow agent. You don't need the assistance of somebody outside, except that you'd need somebody who knows how to make a smart contract in the first place, which is a whole other ball of wax. <laughs> but you don't need an escrow agent necessarily. Um, and why wouldn't somebody want an escrow agent? What reasons? Well, so one of, one of the really interesting parts of, of especially multi-sig, is that traditionally when we think of, of escrow agents, mm -hmm. They are bankers or lawyers, and they keep banker and lawyer hours, and they charge banker and lawyer fees. Oh, I saw that. Um, <laughs> so it's okay. You're working on this, aren't you? Um, I know that was for the bankers, not, not for me. Uh, but, right? So, you know, the thing is, is um, we don't have to do that anymore. You can have anyone be a third party, which is really, really interesting and really powerful, and that also brings open a whole other market on, you know, what, what fees. Um, are charged. What rules do people, you know, what rules do people follow? All, there, are, there are all of these ways that we can now redesign systems that work for us. And so we can take back the power in having escrow. Why multi-sig is especially cool is because unlike traditional escrow, with escrow you actually have to give custody of whatever it is to the third party, right? So that's why you have to have a trusted person or someone who's bonded or someone who has a fiduciary duty because if you're going to give me the deed and all the money, you have to trust that I'm not going to run away with it as a third party, right? With multi-sig, you don't have to do that. So you can you can have the third party, but they don't actually have custody. They can't do anything on their own. That's a really, really powerful tool. So if everything goes well, the third party isn't even involved. In a traditional escrow setting, the third party is always involved in everything, okay? So in, in multi-sig, the third party doesn't even have to know anything's happening. The, the buyer and seller can execute fully on their own and not have to worry about it. So that would be really helpful 
you know, when I think of a need for justice, I'm obviously uh, pretty disappointed in the justice system in the U.S., for example. Um, but that's not even necessarily where this could be really mind-blowing. Like, you could be in Africa and do something, or like in some other place where they don't have escrow agents roaming around charging a bunch of money. I mean, at least we have them, even though they're expensive and it's a pain in the butt to deal with them. If you're in another country, um, what about like with international transactions? I guess that would be easier as well because you won't have to go in person and have to do those kinds of um, transactions. I mean, you can't physically make it. And then you'd have to get a notary and blah, blah, blah. Right. Well, and, and international is, is, I mean, there are so many applications for Bitcoin and, and blockchain technology in international or, or cross markets. You know, when we're looking at what does it look like if, um, for example, someone is in Africa and we want to do a deal. If we want to do it through traditional banking, it's weeks of waiting. You have currency exchange. Then you have the, the challenge of, well, okay, what happens if something goes badly? Where, where where do you go? How do you get the parties to do what they promised they, that they were going to do? So you have to have choice of law clauses. And so the more that we can automate, the better off I think everyone is. Um, a lot of times I have people ask me, you know, am I advocating for the demise of lawyers? And uh, no, <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> what I'm advocating for is the idea of having lawyers serve people. So just because we have smart contracts doesn't mean that we don't need lawyers. What it means is, is that the lawyers that are drafting contracts that should be widely available, and many are widely available on the internet today, um, those sorts of jobs fall, fall to the side. But those people who are working to, to help clients navigate the legal system and help them you know, make sure that they're in a, in a good position to deal with international transactions and all sorts of other things, those jobs don't go away. You know, good counsel is good counsel. So a couple of questions going back to the, the lawyer accord thing or whatever it's called. What's it Common. called? Common accord. Common accord, okay. So are they trying to build laws that will be international or are they trying to codify contracts? So right now it's my understanding that they're focused on contracts. And so they're not building new law. What they're doing is they're taking existing contracts and existing law and they're making it available to everyone. And they're making it available in code form. And why that matters is because um, I see that on the chat there's a question about is there a way for a non-coder to verify that the coded contract is, is what you actually intended. Yes, and that's the whole point of Common Accord. So what happens is you can say as a coder, yes, you know, I want to pull in this clause and this clause and this clause and this clause. And then if you're a, a non-coder, you can say, hey, can I see the, the English language version of this? And it will compile and pull together all of the clauses that are in this contract. The other really cool thing is that you can have a, an array of contract clauses. So you can have, you know, five or six different options and you get to pick which ones you want. So you can say, yeah, I like this, I don't like that. So you actually have the real negotiation um, before the contract is signed, which um, for, for anyone who's watching right now, um, if you are the person who actually reads every clause in a contract before you sign it, you are probably a lawyer uh, because no, no regular people really do that. Um, and the reason is because it's written in legalese and no one really knows you know, what it is anyway. And many contracts are like, okay, we'll take it or leave it. So this allows us to have many more options in drafting contracts and, and selecting clauses. It gives us a lot more power. So can somebody make up a contract piecemeal from going to that website? Like say I can't afford um, somebody to, like say I can't uh, get my own contract because I can't afford to pay a lawyer to write me a contract. Can I go to the site and try and just piecemeal one together from the information that's there? That is not the function of it. That's So right now it's still in beta. They're still building it. But they have a number of contracts that you can take a look at. And yeah, I mean, you can, you can download. What it's really for is embedding in code. Um, if what you want is just a paper contract, you can go to, to a site called Docracy. And that has tons of, of contracts already that are... Um, 
that are reviewed by people and chunks are taken out of it. So that that's a good option as well. So, okay, that's a little overwhelming. Let's say <laughs> I want to do, no, it's okay. I mean, these are completely new topics. So I want to yeah. just really try and try and understand. So if I wanted to make a smart contract, now we kind of generally understand what would happen, but like, where would I go? How would I even do something like that? Say me and my uh, anarchist friend, we both love Bitcoin, we're into it. How do we do a contract like that? Is there a way that, that we could serve it ourselves or do we need an attorney or, or how does that work? That's a great question. Uh, so, it, and it really depends on what the contract is for. Um, so application and use really, really matters when we're talking about smart contracts. So to the extent that you can automate, to the extent that you can agree on payment terms and payment times and you can put the money up in a multi-sig for escrow, you know, that sort of smart contract is available right now. But as far as a contract with its full terms, able to be executed on the blockchain and definitively proved, proven in court, um, that doesn't exist yet. So we have to get to the point where we have smart contracts first. And then they'll they'll necessarily end up in court just because that's how people are. Um, and I know that we many times don't want to think that way, um, but but in reality, um, that's what happens. And so a lot of times people ask, you know, smart contracts can get them out of the judicial system. You know, can we be above or beyond the judicial system in some way? And the answer is always no. And the reason that it's no is because inevitably people live in a jurisdiction. And when they've been wronged and when they feel like they've been horribly wronged, they will go to court in their local area. So you can't stop people from doing that. Um, and no sovereign nation will, will stop people from doing that. They're not going to say to their citizen, oh, yeah, no, you can't come to court. That's one of the, the services of government, at, at least as far as that government views. Um, what is the deal with arbitration then? Yeah. Because you always say that there should be an arbitration clause in a contract, so maybe you could explain that a little bit. Sure. Um, well, so my my thinking in this area has has evolved and, and kind of changed and attested some things, and so you know now in my contracts, I require um, a good faith effort of negotiation first, which is basically just between the two parties. We're going to in good faith try to work this out. Then if that doesn't work, we go to mediation. And mediation is, is non-binding. And then if that doesn't work, then we go to arbitration. And arbitration is, is binding. And what that means to, to, um, to you and to anyone who has an arbitration clause that's in many countries, um, what that means is that the arbitrator's decision is final, which means that the local court in many instances, not all. If it's done properly, if it's executed properly, if the arbitration is done properly, what that means is that the local court can't open it up again and go, hmm, let's see if they found the right facts. No. Whatever the arbitration decision is, they have to enforce it. And that means a lot because, remember, each step of the judicial process takes a lot of time and a lot of money. So if you can have a final decision like arbitration, that, that really local courts will enforce, that's a powerful tool. Also, arbitration is significantly different than traditional court systems in that um, the discovery time can be limited. You can do video participation. So when we talk about having international contracts, you can include uh, an arbitration clause that allows you to participate in any hearing via um, you know, Skype if you want to, or Google Hangout, whatever. Um, and that, again, allows for, ever, for people to have justice without losing because they don't have money or time to travel or hire a lawyer. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, how else can Bitcoin help the legal system because there, people have suggested to me that it could be used. You know, I was at jury duty the other day. And you're Lucky supposed you. to be a jury of, of your peers. And How'd what that I noticed out? was that every person there wanted to get out of jury duty, except for really old people that had nothing else to do or unemployed people. Otherwise, everybody was just dying to get out of there. So that's really problematic. I mean, 
you look at the Silk Road case next week, uh, Lynn Ulbricht is going to be talking to me. The sentencing is this Friday, May 29th, in New York. Um, and, you know, that was a weird case because it's supposed to be a jury of his peers. Well, what peers does he have? People don't even understand what Bitcoin is. How are they supposed to make a judgment about that type of a case? And now he's facing life in prison because of that lack of justice. Um, let's let's go beyond smart contracts. How else can Bitcoin help? Well, um, in a perfect world, in my perfect world, um, which might not be yours, but you know, I, I would really like to see um, a, a kind of a distributed justice model where we move from this idea of having um, having a jury of your peers being people who live near you. I, I think that 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 idea is, is pretty antiquated. Um, and especially especially given technology today where a jury of my peers might be people that are located all over the world and not necessarily just in the county or city that I live in. Um, I think that we can do better and I think we should do better. I think that we can streamline the process in a number of ways. And so I've talked a bit uh, before about this idea of, of justice coin. And, um, in, in, in a nutshell, Justice Coin is, is this idea of creating a, a distributed jury pool. Um, you couldn't really do it. I mean, you could, but I, I doubt that states would buy into doing it for, uh, for criminal matters. But for civil matters, you could create a global jury pool whereby people can participate in jury duty from their own home for a certain amount of, of time. Um, and they could watch videos, and they could look, you know, look at documents online, and then they could render a decision. This, the idea is that instead of having you know, um, a, a jury pool made up of people who, are, who either couldn't get out of jury duty or maybe aren't you know, technologically savvy or, or whatever, maybe they really don't have a background in whatever it is that's happening, we, could, we can use people's education and, and their skill set and have them deciding disputes that are based upon those things. Arguably, those are the things that they're interested in, right? And those are the things that they're best able to, to really weigh in on. So, for example, if there was, um, you know, maybe if there was a, a, a copyright issue, or maybe if there was some sort of um, publishing or, or, or magazine, you know, publishing sort of issue, you, know, you might be perfect for that. But you don't want to participate in jury duty. Why? Because it sucks, right? Because you're stuck there for however long. You have no idea. You have no idea of the case. You might not be interested in the case at all. And you don't get paid. So, you know, you're basically sitting there trying to do the right thing and give, you know, give back to the community. At the same time, it's at, it's at an immense personal cost. And we don't have to do that anymore. So we can shift Bitcoin and this technology and, and use it to shift that, that inefficiency. In the How quickly do you think that that would be something that would be adopted? I'm thinking in the U.S. because it's this big bloated behemoth of bureaucracy. <laughs> um, that was good. That was a nice raise, yeah. You know, I, I don't think that they're going to implement something that quickly, even though this is supposed to be one of the last vestiges of justice. I think that what we're seeing with Bitcoin in general is its application in smaller populations, um, and then I guess in, in smaller countries, um, that that's somewhere where that may be able to be put into practice. Do you agree with that? Well, I mean, when you couple things like when you couple things like um, arbitration and, and mediation with this technology, the idea is that we don't have to wait for a they or a them to adopt it. We can adopt it. So we can't make the state adopt this sort of idea. But what we can do is provide for alternative dispute resolution mechanisms within our contracts. And as long as they're binding and as long as they're legal and have due process, then we can end up we can end up with a different system. We can use technology, and we don't have to wait for the courts or the state to, to adopt this. Um, can I jump in and, and answer a question on the chat? Um, well, I wanted to I wanted to just clarify that really quickly. Sure. So if that was if me and you have a contract and we get into a fight in our original contract, we could say. We trust the crowd at Liberty.me to do arbitration for us because they have similar values to us, and we're not going to go to court. We're going to let it be settled by Liberty.me jury. 
does that is that how it would work and that would be how you would get out of the system yes it um, I can't give you a definitive yes and say that will definitely work so there are um, a number of different rules that have to be followed so the, the key the, the key deciding factor as to whether or not arbitration um, is is binding is whether or not due process was followed so providing that you know the jurors at liberty.me followed all the rules and we created some sort of arbitration process that liberty.me participants could could use and it was conforming then yeah the, their their decision their verdict would stand yes that's yeah. awesome why don't yeah. we ask uh, why don't we answer a couple of the questions in the chat I saw that there were a couple good ones sure so um, I I see a question that says so people would volunteer to be jurors yeah, the idea is that, and, and you know, this isn't completely fleshed out. So feel free to for, to, to jump in and say, "Hey, no, um, you know, really, this is about having a dialogue." Um, but you know, the idea is that I, I believe that people do want to participate in this sort of system. I think that people do want to help other people solve their problems. I think the current system is just inefficient, and it makes it um, there's really no incentive to participate, other than a, a happy feeling that you did something good, I guess. Um, so, so the idea is that people would volunteer to be jurors and they would participate in the system because they would be rewarded with some sort of justice token. It doesn't have to be a justice token, it could be Bitcoin, it could be anything, but the idea is that they could be rewarded um, by participating in the system and then they could then either trade those coins out for something else or they could use the system for their own dispute. So if you volunteer to be a juror, you basically uh, build up credit in the system. And then you're able to then use that credit in, in whatever way you want. The next question was, um, wouldn't that cause uh, undue influence, right? And so, yeah, this is this is a great question. The idea is that the pool would be so large. If we're talking about a global pool, right? If we're talking about a global pool, the idea, the, the hope, is that the, the pool would be so large, maybe, say, 30, 40,000 people, 50,000 people, which really isn't that many. But, but ideally, you would have more than 100 people um, making a decision on every single case. The other distinction that I think would be necessary is that people would have to justify why they, had, why they, why they came out a certain way. Um, you know, they wouldn't have to write a full legal opinion or anything like that. The idea is that you would have to justify, okay, I watched the videos, this was compelling to me, this was compelling to me, this was compelling to me. And why that matters is because right now in the jury system, we don't have that. And so you can actually build behavior based upon best practices. And those best practices can then be used so that we understand and, again, we can avoid the system again and again and again. So the idea is to build up precedent, but build up precedent based upon how jurors actually decide. Does that make sense? I think so. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You're like, I don't know. Like people have, like, competitive jury pools. So the Let's Talk Bitcoin jury has a better rep than the Liberty.me jury for this one type of thing. I oh, mean, would wow, there okay. be competitive jury pools potentially? Yeah. I, I mean, I guess, yeah. I, I never really thought of it that way because in, in my world, it seems like it would be much better to have kind of one big decentralized, almost like um, you know, like a decentralized organization where it just kind of comes up on a lottery versus you know, having a bunch of competing jury pools. But I guess you could do that, too. I, that's not for me to decide. For the market to decide, right? <laughs> I, I can't do that. I wonder but, if the state would mind people doing that. I wonder how soon it would take for, for that to become targeted. But, I mean, yeah. I think it's great because it would potentially, um, you know, I, I had uh, this guy, He I sold him some Bitcoin, and he wrote me a check for it. And the check bounced. Oh, oh. Yeah. And so this happened you know, six months ago. And I'm not going to get a court case at small claims court for another six months. Do you need me to write a letter? No, you don't. You don't need to write a letter. But I'm just saying, like, <laughs> I had to wait that long to get a court case in the first place. So, you know, when you have something go wrong, um, you think, it, it, unless you've actually had something go wrong and you've had to go through the process, you think, I have a contract and oh but I'm right it's so obvious that I'm right all of those things are really really irrelevant because there are all these other things that come into play can you wait until you can get your money 
How are you going to pay the person um, to, to represent you? When is your court case going to be in 7,000 years? Well, big, fat, a lot of good that does me. You know, all those things can really influence it. Um, you know, last week we had the show. You just watched it, and uh, you advised me um, with the panda situation with the guy that they fired me from the case because I reported being sexually harassed. And even that, I mean, the law says that you have to be not a 1099, you have to be a W-2, and, and I've tried to go through all these proper channels in order to remedy that situation for such a long time, and it's still not remedied. And, you know, if I had gotten the money that I was owed back then, and if I had done a smart contract, then none of this would have even come up. And instead, all these lost opportunities um, have, have really been very... Uh, bad for me, I guess, for lack of a better way of explaining it. I mean, it's been it's been a really big mess. So I think that having other solutions is really important. And do you think, are other lawyers as excited about this stuff as you are, or are they all just waiting to feed off of the blood of the suffering? <laughs> no, no, no. There's a lot of really, really interesting, um, great lawyers in this space. And, um, you know, I, I get contacted a couple times a week from startups in the space saying, hey, you know, I saw you on the show, I heard you, and um, can, can you help me? And, uh, you know, unfortunately, because of their key solutions, because we just launched, I'm not accepting the clients right now. But I refer people out to, to great lawyers um, all around who are interested in the same things that I'm interested in. You know, they're interested in, in helping people navigate the system um, as efficiently as and in, inexpensively in, in as possible. Um, and you know, so I'm, I'm happy to, to make referrals. Um, can we go back to a question in the chat? Sure. Okay. So um, I saw a question, something about if there's one pool, wouldn't that be centralized? And it depends, really. It depends on what the process is for becoming a, a pool member and, and how that works. But it doesn't necessarily have to be, quote, unquote, centralized. What I mean when I say decentralized is that there's no one person, one party, one group of people in the middle making decisions for the entire thing. So you could have a voting pool whereby all of the, a jury pool, whereby all of the members vote for what's going to happen with X, Y, and Z, right? And so we can rethink governance. We can rethink, um, we can rethink management at the top and, and, and directorships of companies based upon this ability to, to vote. And right now, we can do that with multi-sig, with complex multi-sig. So uh, I wrote this article for um, the, what, what was that, the, the uh, Women's Day, International Women's Day, that's what it was. Uh, for, for, I'm like, I wrote this article. Um, and basically, it was about how you can, you can uh, manage co-ops using multi-sig. And what I mean by that is you can democratize small co-ops, so 15 or more people. You can actually have um, a multi-sig address that has up to 15 signers on it. So imagine we are part of an organization. Let's say we're part of an, organi an organization that has five members. Okay, we could create a multi-sig. Um, we could create a multi-sig address whereby the funds all go into that address any way we want, right? No one has to sign to have the money go in. But it would require three out of the five signatures in order to take money out. So basically, that would require a discussion amongst the people who were involved, who were signers, and they would all have to agree, and they would all have to, to signify their agreement by signing the transaction. And so you can change the, the management structure and the power structure and the dynamic structure within organizations simply by using multi-sig and using it appropriately and, and, and setting up companies or organizations or associations that reflect that. Okay. Um, should we talk about third key solutions at all and what exactly that is and what problem did that set out to solve? Sure. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite subjects, third key solutions. <laughs> uh, so, you know, third key grew from my law practice and from people constantly asking me, hey, will you hold third key? You know, we have this, it first started out as corporate governance. 
So what I mean by that is we know that there are a lot of regulations that are out there that talk about how companies have to behave and et cetera, et cetera. So when we look at Bitcoin, we say, well, how can we use this tool to avoid regulations when we can and kind of navigate them when we can't? What, what can we do? So one of the ways that, um, that we show as an industry that, that we are interested in consumer protection, right, because we hear stories all the time about how Bitcoin is bad for consumers, which is a lie. Um, it's bad management that's bad for consumers, bad people that are bad for consumers. It's not the technology. The technology is neither good nor bad. Um, but so we started, you know, I started looking at how can I help startups in this space uh, use multi-sig for corporate government. And what I mean by that is, let's say that you and I start a company, and we're fortunate enough to get funding in Bitcoin. So let's say we get 300 Bitcoin. Yeah, you guys are awesome. Yay. Oh, yeah, I know, right? Who knew? It's that easy. Uh, so, so we get funding in Bitcoin, and then all of a sudden it's like, okay, well, where do we put it? Well, we've seen so many stories about one person running away with the money or um, them getting hacked, right? Or some, right, right, hacked. Something terrible happened, and oh, the money's gone. I don't know uh, what happened. I don't know I what happened. What happened. I'm going to go on my new yacht now. Bye. <laughs> exactly. Excuse me. I need to leave the country, but I'm not really sure what happened to the money, right? So how do we prevent that from happening? Well, it's really, really easy with multi -stay. One of the ways you can do that, and if your investor is Bitcoin savvy, which many times if they're giving you Bitcoin, they are, you can create a multi-sig address where the investor is a signer on the account. Why that's really cool is because, and they don't have to be a primary signer, right? They don't have to be part of the form. So it could be you and I and an investor, okay? So there's three of us. So that would be a two of three. So we would need two signatures in order to execute a transfer. Why that's great is because there's no more, oh, Pamela got hacked. No, now it would have to be Pamela and Tatiana got hacked, right? And so the likelihood of that it is reduced substantially. Um, also, something that you can do with Bitcoin that you can't do with traditional currency is in a, in a traditional investor role, someone who gives money has to wait around for the CEO or the manager to tell them about the financial health of the company, right? Once I give you $100,000, Tatiana, and you put it in your, you know, wherever bank account, I don't have access to that account, right? So I have to say, hey, Tatiana, where are you at with the money? How are things? Can you send me a report? What's going on, right? With Bitcoin, you don't have to do that. You can just put a watch on the address, and even if that investor isn't a signer, they can see every single transaction. That's great because, again, it, it promotes discussion. It, provo it promotes discussion with the investor, the promotes discussion within the organization. So you don't have that like, oh, I didn't really know what I was signing when I signed that check over to myself. You know, you reduce the chances of embezzlement. You reduce the chances of fraud and coercion. All of these things simply by using the technology as it is right now. So that's a really powerful tool. And so third key came from that. And then I started get, getting contacted by wallet companies who were saying, hey, can you hold a third key for you know our our wallet and then exchange it. Hey, can you you know can you help us with cold storage? So this happened you know so many times that uh, I I just decided to make it a business in and of itself because I really really wanted to focus on this. I think that it provides a huge service um, for the community and I think that um, especially for the B two B like for exchanges and wallets. You know, we see even like last week, you know, we saw another exchange was hacked. And why is that? Well, it's because they were holding their hot, you know, their hot wallet in a single signer account. Well, why are they doing that? Because because multisig has been around for a really long time, right? So why are they holding it in single signer accounts? Well, the reality is that it's it's challenging on an institutional level, on a big scale, on a, on a, on a high volume to implement multi-sig in a way, in an existing business that's already operating. So you need planning, you need process, you need testing, you need all of these things. And so, you know, it's, it can be challenging to take that and, and focus your efforts from doing what you do every day, which is I'm an exchange or I'm a wallet provider, I'm whatever. You take your, your focus and then you shift it over to, okay, now I'm going to try to do multi-sig and cold storage and do all these things. So it, it, it's challenging to do that. And so in doing it so many times, I recognized that 
you know, this is this is something that the industry needs help with, and this is this is a service that I can provide. Wasn't there some sort of an issue though that you um, said that has not been solved yet, making one person a honeypot, or is that? Yeah. What no. So, you know, as I'm looking at this and as we're looking at this, you know, I have an incredible team um, at, at Third Key. I'm very fortunate. Um, but, you know, we're looking at all of us on the team are really, really interested in looking at processes and, and looking at what's happening in the, you know, in the typical traditional world and asking why. And so why, are we, why do we do things that way? What problem does it solve? And can we change that or can we make things more efficient with with you know Bitcoin or or um, Bitcoin technology, so one of the ways that you know one of the things that we're thinking about as we're implementing. So we recently announced uh, a partnership with Case Wallet. I don't know if you're if you're familiar with Case. So Case Wallet, yeah, um, big fan. Yeah, 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 me too. Uh, so I'm, I'm privileged to be working with them. I really, really like them. I really like their product and, and their team. But you know when when we're looking at Case and the implementation. You know, a lot of times people say, well, hey, we want, you know, multi-sig, we want third-party independent identity verification, right? And that sounds right, right? Like, it sounds good. You're like, yeah, okay, we want, you know, the, the customer to have a key, and we want case to have a key, and we want someone else, a third party, to have a key and be able to identify this, this third party, you know, the, the user, independently without any, you know, any information from case, et cetera, right? And it feels good. You know, let's let's send them a text message. Let's verify. Hey, Tatiana, do you really want to do this? And you're like, Yeah, I do, right? And that feels good. But when you actually start to look at it, it's not so good. And here's why. In order to do that text verification, I have to have I, me, meaning third key solutions, has to have your customer data, and not just yours. I have to have all the customer data, right? Because how can I verify it later when you want to do a recovery if I don't have it to start with? If I get it at the time of recovery, there's only one party I can get it from, and that's Case, right? If I get it from Case, for example, I'm using Case as an example, if I get it from Case at the time that your wallet is missing, how can I verify that that is authentic information? It doesn't actually protect from case being a bad actor. Does that make sense? We want the third party yeah. verification because we want protection from case or the wallet provider being having a bad actor there. But it doesn't actually protect unless we get the information first. So if we get the information first, then we become this big honeypot of all of the customer data and right? Oh, now I have, you know, Case is my client. I have a number of other clients. Pretty soon I have a nice big beacon. Hey, do you want to know anyone anything about you know people in Bitcoin? Well, you could go to Turkey Solutions and take their customer database, right? So this is what we want to avoid. We want to avoid recreating this idea of keeping customer information with third parties. We want an independent knowledge-based verification. And so what we're doing is we're creating systems that not only protect the third party or the, the, the customer as much as possible, but they also protect not only their Bitcoin, but they also protect their information. We're also really, really privacy minded. So we're looking at creating different solutions whereby we don't create a honeypot for whomever the government seizure or for you know hackers to come in and, and find out information about everyone. And, and um, I'm sorry, the chat was too funny. Uh, no, we cannot protect uh, you from having Nicholas Cage be a bad actor. We cannot do that. Um, but we can, however, um, we can protect from people inside an organization, a single bad actor within an organization. So one of the things that we do is we verify with people within an organization, voice verify and PGP and all sorts of other um, checks and balances, and we make sure that they're following their internal policies. And as long as their internal policies are strong, the consumer should be protected. And they'll definitely be more well protected than if I just send them a text message, right? Okay. Additionally, a lot of times we forget that um, text message verification only counts if your phone wasn't stolen. 
Right. So, you know, you've got email. So many people now have text and email on their phone and your Bitcoin wallet. So if your Bitcoin wallet is stolen and you've lost your phone and they text message you to verify, it's pretty easy to, to spoof that. It's pretty easy to fake it. So while it feels, you know, warm and fuzzy, like, yeah, we've got this third-party verification, it really doesn't play out to a safer overall scenario for the end user. And that's what we really care about. So is there a solution, the third key, like is it is it foolproof yet or are you kind of just still building it out or how, like is that it? We don't have a solution or we do? <laughs> yeah, I mean there are lots of different options, you know, there's, there's a million different options and that's part of what we do is we talk with our clients about, okay, let's look at what our overall goals are. You know, we want to protect the, the, the clients first and foremost, you know, the, the, the end users. We want to protect them. We want to protect their information. Um, we also have to consider costs, right? I mean, you could, in theory, have you know, Experian verifying identity for every person. Do you want to do that? It also depends on whether or not they're located within the U.S. It depends on whether or not they're complying with you know, uh, AML, KYC sort of stuff. It depends on, you know, we have clients all over the world. Some of them are, are, are not required to comply with that and some of them don't want to comply with that. So we really build customized solutions based upon the idea of, you know, again, consumer privacy, consumer protection, and and um, building solutions that work with the community. Cool. So where do you see the future of Bitcoin going? Mm. I guess it's kind of hard to tell, but I, I like I, asking that question. I want I your prediction. Know. I don't know. You know, I, I know that there's a lot of investment. There's a lot of institutional buy-in. Um, you know, I'm conflicted about that. Uh, but, you know, ultimately, uh, I think that Bitcoin is here to stay. I don't think it's going anywhere, um, and, and I'm happy about that. I think that the technology is allowing us to rethink systems, and, again, it's allowing us to ask why. You know, why do we have banking out? Why do we have to have a third party in the middle of all of our transactions? Why can't everyday people get the same protections that the, the, the most well-off people get? Why can't we have an independent third party? Why, why, why do we have to use these traditional, typical means in order to protect ourselves? And, and what is consumer protection really? And how do we stop paying lip service to consumer protection and actually implement things on our own with our own technology that do in fact protect consumers and, and protect investors. Do you think that the government could benefit or abuse some of this technology? Like how do we prevent the abuse of this technology? I mean I think, I, I can't say that every single person in government is a horrible monster that can't, just can't wait to, you know, take advantage of, of the poor little servant class. But um, you know, there, there are definitely some, some people in the government that love that type of thing. So how do we, the people, which outnumber the government, at least let's say we can have an anarchist society, we're, I don't even know if we're necessarily ready for that, whatever, different discussion. How do we make sure that the government takes advantage of this technology in the best way versus um, in a way that kind of continues to uh, like tighten the noose, so to speak? Well, um, one of the things that, that I work on um, in my spare time is uh, all your spare time? Right, all my spare time. My buckets and buckets of spare time. Um, you know, I, I, I really, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but I, I'm really, really focused on consumer protection and using technology and not regulation to meet those goals. And I think that the technology does it more efficiently, it does it better, and we as an industry can create our own standards. Um, one of the things that we haven't talked about yet, and I know we're running out of time, but um, we, uh, concurrently with our launch of Third Key Solutions, we announced um, something called the Key Recovery Network. And it's an industry association that's, that's dedicated to creating um, industry standards for recovery. So it's all about how do we recover funds, and I don't want to get too technical, but you know, we're now looking at hierarchical Hierarchical, oh my gosh, I can never say that word. Hierarchical, deterministic, multi-sig wallets. Okay, so let's just break it down. Easy trees, okay? So we're talking about, you know, creating these trees that kind of all mesh together in order to create consumer wallets. And that's awesome. 
but it also has a whole other aspect of recovery. So we as an industry can create best practices and we don't need the government to come in and write regulations on how we should be treating our, our customers and how we should be treating you know, participants in the network. We can create our own um, recovery standards and we can have auditable standards like the CCSS for example. And if anyone out there doesn't know what the CCSS is, um, it's the cryptocurrency uh, security standard. And it's out for uh, open public discussion right now. It's, it's on GitHub, it's a public community project, and it's based on creating some standards in the industry about, you know, hey, how do you really, like, how should you generate keys? If you have a business and you're, and you're creating consumer wallets, you know, you need to have sufficient sources of entropy. You need to have, you know, there, there are a lot of different rules that, and standards that you need to be following. And so by creating industry standards, we can then have auditable standards where we can have people come in and go, hey, you know, are you doing this? Are you doing that? Are you storing backup keys off-site? Are you, you know, security checking people who have signing authority on your corporate account? Not individuals. I'm not talking about individuals, but what I'm saying is if I'm a, if I'm a Bitcoin company and I'm taking in people's money, you know, and I'm signing their transactions, shouldn't I have a background check? My vote is yes. We don't need government to tell us that, though. We can do that on our own, and we are doing that on our own. So comment is still open for CCSS, and if you're interested in that sort of nerd stuff, um, like I am, you can go there and check it out and, and make comments and participate in the process, and I, I really encourage you to do that. Okay. This has been really, really good. Um, I want to have you back on another time, and I want to kind of review some of this stuff, because I know it could be a little bit tricky. Uh, before before we go, let me just make sure that there's no other questions. There's some really good jokes about Nicolas Cage on here for some reason. He's the butt of jokes. I actually think he's a fine actor. Um, and I did and I did like Face Off. So that was a nice tie in there. I, I can't really see who said that, but I have Face Off right, right. There was a pun right. going on. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so where can people find out more about what you're doing and catch up with you. Uh, Third Key Solutions obviously has its site. You could plug that and, and your other stuff. Where can people catch up and find out more? Right. Um, well, you can find me at Empowered Law, E-M-P-O-W-E-R-E-D Law.com. You can find me at thirdkey.solutions. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Pamela J-D, P-A-M-E-L-A-W-J-D. That's probably the easiest way. Pamela. Get it? I never knew that. I was like, what is this WJD thing? Like, what is that? Um, oh, now I know. I'll always remember that. What's the JD stand for? First doctor. It's a law degree. Oh, sorry, fancy pants. No, no, no. It's just, uh, listen, Pam, the fabulous Pamela Morgan was taken. So, oh. you know, I got to settle for second best. Fine, that's acceptable. Also, don't you go on that lawyer show sometimes, the Bitcoin lawyer show? That I sounds do. like if people I are do. more interested in that uh, type of thing. Yeah, sometimes um, the Bitcoin Lawyer podcast is great. It's really, really fun. It's hosted by Ryan Gilbert. He's amazing, and I've been fortunate enough to be asked to, to co-host a few episodes, so that's been great. Uh, it's available on, uh, on iTunes and wherever people find uh, podcasts. Awesome. All right. Well, um, my name is Tatiana Moroz. This has been the Tatiana Moroz Show. Uh, thank you, everybody at Liberty.me for your help putting this together. Hello to all my people out in LTB land. Hey, Pam, we're going to need a magic word for the LTB folks. So what, what should the magic word be? You can choose it. Oh, I get to choose it? Yes. That's pretty exciting. Um, let's go with... What should we go with? I think it's got, can it be two words? Yes, it could be two words. It's going to be Nick Cage. Nick Cage? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I like that. I like what that. else could it be? I thought we were going to go with Jazzercise, but I think that Nick Cage is good. I think Nick Cage is much better. Because somebody might guess with your Jazzercise girl. I know. So known. Yeah, um, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much for joining me today. I can't wait to catch up with you next time. Uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Again, liberty.me. Let's talk Bitcoin. Peace out, homies. Have a good night. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week with uh, Lynn Ulbricht um, on June 1st, 9 p.m. Eastern, Monday night. Peace out. Thanks, Thank Tatiana. You. Bye. Bye.
Thanks for listening to Liberty.me Studio. The views expressed on this show are not necessarily those of Liberty.me. Join the global Liberty community today at Liberty.me. Liberty lives here.